Well, we're we're so um, happy to have Vicky McKinnon this evening to talk to us about her experience. Vicky, um, maybe let let's start with your Montessori story. I always like to hear those because they're they're always so varied. How people stumble across Montessori. Um, it's yeah, not sure. something most of us grow up into, except for um, Marie Rose. But a little bit of noise. People are arriving at my house for PT. Um, so uh, I commenced as a secondary uh, teacher. Um, my curriculum areas were music and English, and I did that for six years. And in my sixth year of doing that, um, my parents decided to um, look at retiring into a business and settled on childcare. And I had always... Uh, felt that the early years were very critical for children. Uh, I particularly remember teaching um, a child in year eight who had some kind of um, short-term memory issue and was unable to spell anything. Uh, and I remember the disdain with which he was treated by some of the other teachers in my school. And so I always felt that the early years were so incredibly vital. So I went on and studied a uh, graduate diploma in early childhood um, and we commenced work with my parents in 94 and full-time in 95. Um, so I moved from secondary, which is uh, a very teacher-directed type of program. In fact, you plan three years in advance with a work program. You design the learning experiences and the assessment items um, and then implement it over the next three years until the next work program is written. But one thing always resonated with me from my training, which was that intrinsically motivated children uh, have far more engagement and better outcomes with learning than extrinsically motivated children. So as I word, wrote word, um, work programs, I was trying to build as much choice into the types of assessment tasks as I could. And then moving into early childhood, it was something of a relief um, to find that the children had a level of autonomy over their engagement and their learning. Uh, however, in the, the regular early childhood in the 90s, I found very little guidance. The first 52 principles of accreditation that came out uh, in 94 mentioned being uh, aware of children's uh, development um, against, I'm not sure if it was Rankin or Deakin or something measurement. And when I asked the department for this, it wasn't actually available. Mm. And so we would plan things for children uh, based on observations and they wouldn't actually be interested or they would be away that day. And the whole planning cycle became something of a nonsense, uh, which, which I um, evaluated. I, I only spent six months actually on the floor, but I went into a more as it happens type of program we called it a free flow which suited the children much better mm. so when um we talked to uh david nibby some of you may know him about montessori uh he was selling uh neen house at that time uh he was organizing for mrs diker to fly over from uh perth mm. once a month for a weekend um and so i uh enrolled um, along with several others that I work with at the time. And we commenced uh, the training in the middle of a play-based service. And it was um, quite uh, an interesting learning process because Mrs. Dyker did the traditional, I've got all my notes, I read them to you, approach to training. And I remember we just bombarded her with questions and she'd very patiently answer our questions. And um, correct us uh, when we said something ludicrous. Uh, one I remember is um, she said, children learn by doing. So we all madly got, oh, that's hands-on learning. She said, no, that's not what I said. I said, children learn by doing. And we kind of went, but that's like hands-on learning. She said, if you say hands-on learning, that implies there's such a thing as hands-off learning I said children learn by doing mm. and those subtleties of meaning uh, were inherent in almost every sentence she spoke 
And I became incredibly invested in the philosophy of Montessori. And despite having five years of education um, preparation under my belt, I really had hardly come across Montessori at all, except by chance I did an interview for a subject with a counsellor who had his children in what must have been an earlier iteration of Brisbane Montessori School, because that would have been 1987. So in 2003, January, we opened our first Montessori service. The uh, service we'd been in previously ended up being sold for various reasons. And in that service, um, I commenced the overwhelmingly challenging task of creating a Montessori long daycare service. Um, I know that we didn't live up to our own aspirations, which I think is not an uncommon experience for people trying to open a Montessori service. We tried to get someone with substantial Montessori experience, if not actual training in each of the classrooms. And when there was staff turnover, we found ourselves in quite a bind. Uh, we attempted to get people trained and it was an extremely difficult process to the extent that a parent came for an hour, left again and wrote a letter about how dreadfully not Montessori we, we were to our peak body that existed at the time and it was incredibly embarrassing. Mm -hmm. The person who was there, who I think worked for us for one week, passed herself off as Montessori trained to this parent and then just did some dreadful things, which I shudder to think about. So it's been um, a, quite a journey and we are now 20 years on. We just celebrated the 20 year birthday mm -hmm. of oh, that service. And, um, and it's been an absolute joy to see the, the authenticity, the depth and the uh, embedding of the philosophy within our practices across the three services that we currently have. And um it's a big relief when you feel that you can uh, relax uh, about the practices in your services, not that you can ever completely relax, but um, I know I've got great teams and great systems in place that help us maintain that quality. Mm. So how did you fix that problem of not being able to find trained staff? And maybe tell us more too about <clears throat> what you've built up at Building Futures, so like how many staff you have, how many kids you serve. Well, we have the three services and we have one that's uh, currently in DA. So um, that original service that we opened 20 years ago was in Wavell Heights on the northern side of Brisbane. And whilst there, we had been uh, collaborating to some extent with the training organisation that I trained through based in Perth, which had uh, incredibly mixed and inconsistent results. Um, we opened our Forest Lake service, which is like a head office service in 2006. Uh, and then in 2009, we bit the bullet and um, I don't have gray hair yet, which is a bit of a miracle, but I should after what we went through to get our own um, training college registered. Um, we think a sequa is bad, but asqua is its own animal. Um, I can see Cara, who's head of our training college, sitting there. We have many juicy conversations about ASQA uh, because being uh, in charge of learning and training, we have a little bit of knowledge about learning and training and we understand uh, the bureaucracy that we're working within that um, drives us a little bit nuts at times. But in December of 2009, we were a registered training organisation. We added um, early childhood to our scope, certificate three and diploma, as well as um, a Montessori course that was accredited at that time and then expired. And then we worked on over about four years um, developing a diploma of Montessori. And we've just recently, or CARA actually, giving credit where credit is due, uh, has de developed an accredited certificate three in Montessori. So our recruitment is a lot of fun because we say, great, come on in, um, join our early childhood family. By the way, at this service, you have to do double study compared to any other service. Um, but we'd love you to do that. Um, and so now that the Certificate 3 is uh, accredited, if you come in as a trainee entry level, 
Um, you do a dual enrolment in our Certificate 3 in Early Childhood and our Certificate 3 in Montessori. And because we, the Early Childhood is government funding, we're allowed to do, we're able to do a little bit of cross funding uh, to uh, make the Montessori training more affordable. And the same thing has been going for some time. Become an apprentice, do your diploma of ECEC and we'll cross subsidise a diploma of Montessori. Mm. So the formal training is, is one leg of the stool, but a stool can't stand on one leg. Um, another leg is the prepared environment. And um, we sought a lot of guidance um, about prepared environments over the years. I met a lady called Nancy Lechnawolna in um, uh, 2007, quite by accident. And she came to our services and coached us. And she was a zero to three specialist. So she was able to offer us a lot of guidance. Uh, and so that um, on the floor uh, training was um, part of, I think, what really helped us. So in terms of the prepared environment, how to do the prepared environment, and then the on the floor coaching is the third leg, uh, enabled us to embed some practices in some key staff. And it's about that tipping point. It's about finding the point where you've got enough people who, who have the philosophy that they become the dominant culture. And once you reach that point, it's much easier to perpetuate the practices and, um, and ap approach and attitudes um, that you want in a Montessori service. Mm. So those, those are the three pillars. I think if anyone ever talks to me, I've got a play-based service and I want to um, flip to Montessori, I talk about those three pillars, the formal training, the on-the-floor coaching and the prepared environment. Do you think there's a bit of a stigma in the Montessori community generally about long day care? Like it's not real Montessori because it's not. Oh, there's, there certainly has been. So one very significant zero to three trainer happened to be sitting next to me at a dinner in the 2005 um, uh, Congress in Sydney. Um, and um, she introduced herself and said, I'm a zero to three trainer. I'm like, oh, we would love to have some of your understanding because I knew that zero to three was where we particularly lack. I said, I'm in a long daycare services. We can't do the playgroup model. We don't have the parents with us. And she just looked at me and went, oh, you wouldn't do that to children. And she turned and faced the other way for the entire dinner. Mm -hmm. So definitely. And um I got a bit of a reputation in 2007. The very first Montessori Australia um, get together for heads of schools. I turned up and I heard everyone introduce themselves around the table. I trained AMI, I trained MWI, which is now Montessori, and I'm principal of blah, blah, blah. And it got to me, um, and I will call out elephants in the room. And I said, hi, my name is Vicky and I'm a second class citizen. And everyone just looked at me. And I said, I'm a second class citizen because I'm not AMI or MWI trained. I'm uh, Australian Montessori Society trained. Uh, not only that, um, I'm not in a school, I'm in a long daycare centre. And additionally, we're for profit, um, not a community based organisation. And the room immediately became very gushy. Lots of people, oh no, you're not a second. I, I actually don't care really, but I just um, called out that elephant in the room. And Montessori absolutely is authentic in long daycare because I think in the blurb for this session, we said that the first casa ran from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was to enable the mums to go to work in the factories that the factory owner had sponsored uh, this service um, for those children. Uh, and Montessori was there with just, I understand, one other teacher and between 50 and 60 children. So today we would call that non-compliant, employer-sponsored long day care. So does long day, care, long day care make it difficult in any way, do you think, to do authentic Montessori today? Well, in preparation we... for this evening, I did write down, I think, four barriers um, uh, that I consider prevent authentic Montessori, they're not necessarily uh, just for long daycare, but some of it is specific to long daycare. So the first and most glaring point is workforce. Mm -hmm. um, not just 
enough people on the floor, but transformed adults. Uh, it's interesting um, that not everyone's a winner. Like you, you employ a bunch of people and they say things that indicate they seem to have a Montessori heart and that you can even put them through training and they come out the other, day, other end and need to be the star in the room. They don't understand about allowing the children or trusting the children to make their own learning choices. And it just, it is what it is. You can't win everyone, but trying to get that tipping point where it becomes a pervasive culture of your service, um, having enough transformed adults to set, set the tone um, I also think that as we're in a staffing crisis period, uh, we will have a lot of job seekers. I just want a job. If I have to do two courses to keep this job, I'll do it. Um, it's not really my idea of a good time, but I'll do, I'll tick the boxes I have to tick to have a job. And so there's also a preference for part-time work. Um, I think that one of the side effects of the COVID period was people really are seeking to have work-life balance. And um, I totally support that. I was a working single mum for many years. Um, and I completely understand that you can't do the right thing by your children. Um, however, uh, consistency for children is also an important factor. So my feeling is the solution for that, which I probably already covered to some extent, is that the workplace must become the transformative process that creates advocates and not just workers. So if you think your marketing is just for families and children, think again, your marketing must also be for your staff. They are your customers for work hours. And then you need to transform them through the culture and the messages that they're receiving in the workplace. The second barrier is what I call consistent cohort. Um, so I think it's ideal that children, especially from Kaza age, um, do attend five days a week. Uh, but of course, we are here to cater for, um, you know, mum who, who wants some time with her children and who um, does work great long days on Tuesday, Wednesday and Friday. And so she has her children in care for eight, nine hours on Tuesday, Wednesday and Friday it's no surprise that she wants to keep them home with her on Monday and Thursday. It makes complete sense. Um, but what that means is that you've got different dynamics in your classrooms mm -hmm. from day to day. And it also decreases the children's ability to access all areas of the program because uh, it's still basically a three-hour work cycle. We, we have trialled at various times having the program open in the afternoon. Um, but uh, it's generally... Um, uh, it's still a Montessori program, but it's outside and it's recreational and um, it needs to cater for children coming and going at different hours of the day. Um, also, the another inconsistent cohort, and it's something that occurs in Queensland, um, is children attending multiple different types of program across the week. Uh, so if you have part-time pre-kinder, preschool, um, here in Queensland it's called kindergarten, um, you'll sometimes find that parents want to access um, these um, community-based sessional kindergartens because they're real education um, and come to your services on the other day for work-related care. Uh, well, we, it did create a bit of a stink, but just over a year ago, we um, brought in a policy that we don't accept children from multiple programs. We don't think that's fair to children. And our argument is, would you send your eight-year-old to two different schools? An eight-year-old is far more able to, to cope with multiple settings than a four-year-old. Why would you do that? Um, and the other thing that's about the cohort is the um, losing the subplane due to the educational structures that we have in this country. And I, I don't think it's just Queensland where we have um, a big divide between the first part of Casa and the second part of Casa, which is in a school setting. Uh, that became mandatory for children to attend PrEP. And we are unable to get recognised as a PrEP program. Um, uh, it's against Queensland legislation to have private operators 
um, operating school. So that's just a hard barrier. Um, the third barrier I've listed is what I call professional trust. And this is a broader issue than just Montessori. And I think it's probably a broader issue uh, in education generally. So I'm just going to read what I wrote. Internal or external mistrust of practice resulting in documentation burden and corrupted educated decision making regarding what is likely to meet compliance requirements, correctly or incorrectly. What I mean by that is we have educators out there who are not observing and moving with the needs of the children. Instead, they're constantly worried in the back of their mind about what documentation standards do I need to meet so I don't get in trouble. So that the auditor doesn't come and tell the service that we're not meeting standards and it goes up on a government website saying this service isn't meeting the standards, they're just working towards the standards or worse. Um, and then you have leaders in these services also going, no, no, we have to have a do a, a, we have to have one observation per month on a child. Uh, and so you need to do one observation a month. Uh, it used to be five focused children a week and you had to get observations on five focused children a week. And even like 15 years ago, I had educators coming to me saying, um, how many observations do I have to do every week? Mm -hmm. And I would spend 10 minutes going through what is professional practice, what is early childhood practice, What's happening that's significant in the room? What have you noticed children doing that is a strength? Have you noticed anything that requires a bit of support to help that child develop in that area? These are the things that you would call an observation because that's what you're going to plan from or plan for, um, for the children. And so it's completely up to your profession. Oh, they say, that sounds fantastic. But how many observations do I have to do a week? And one of the things I've written is that educators are looking for rules to follow to avoid being wrong. Now, this might not seem to be in your face that's affecting Montessori practice, but it is. It's because we've got whole teams out there worrying about what documentation they're going to make and are they going to be okay? Are they going to get pulled in for a performance review? Because they're not meeting set standards and they don't trust their own professional judgment. They don't feel trusted by their management. They don't feel trusted by the government. And so instead of that judgment coming from within them and their observations of children, their relationship with children, their extensive uh, deep understanding of the families and communities in the program and the available resources, they're making decisions based on what's going to tick a box. And that does affect authentic Montessori practice. And the fourth barrier I have written is parent expectations. And I'm going to quote my trainer, Mrs. Dyker, who, uh, who I think was a bit of a rebel in her own way. Um, we would ask her about what reports they did for children. And she would say, we don't give them reports. Why do we need to give them reports? They can see it in their child. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine a schooling system without reports? And in today's world, we have um, communication systems that do improve the parent service relationship and cooperation in the, in the raising of children. And it should be a cooperative partnership. That should be meaningful. And we have aids that make that even more possible um, than in the past. Um, however, uh, you only have to stay on um, the Facebook page I call the Whinge page. They're changing their name. It was EYLF something something. Uh, they're looking at changing their names and it's full of people complaining about parents always wanting photographs. So that's also impacting on what's happening in the classroom because people are trying to get the angle right, trying to get one that looks good. Uh, is the child happy? Have they got their hat on outside? Um, is there a mess on the floor. And so we're staging uh, in our services. 
so that's another potential impact on authentic and many of these that I've outlined are not just um, related to Montessori and long daycare, but probably the inconsistent cohort one and mm -hmm. the the loss of the upper end of the uh, three year subplane mm -hmm. is probably um, that they're probably the two most significant that pertain specifically to early childhood that isn't uh, easily overcome by some of the strategies that we've put in place in our company. Mm -hmm. So much to unpack there. Becky, I really love how you are so good at identifying a problem that's in the way and then going after it in a very uncompromising way. Um, you know, no, no expense spared. What what have you done to take documentation out of the way of um, educators' lives in the classroom and, and remove it as a barrier between them and the child? Yeah, so... Um... A uh, lovely segue uh, into a plug. <laughs> um, we're just in the process of releasing to the broader community um, our app. Uh, it's called Your Child's Day or YCD. Anyone who was at conference the other weekend will have done the dance. It's fun to play on the YCD app. Um, I did see a video of that today. I'm not sure if I want to watch it. Um, so I looked at what's required for documentation. Um, and if you want to uh, have a look at some writing that I'm doing around this, just little blogs, um, it's not up yet, but our YCD uh, website will have some of my blogs up there that I've been writing as I ponder some of these uh, issues. Um, so why do we document? There are, to me, two valid reasons to document. One is what I call professional practice. So that's for you as an educator in the classroom. What do you need to have in writing or digital writing in order to support your practice and the practice of your team? And when it comes to Montessori, uh, I see that there are three, three main things or ways we want to document. First of all, we're wanting to be able to recall, has Johnny yet done um, the long bead chains? Now, you might have a fabulous memory and you might be able to recall what every child in your group across the week has and hasn't done. Um, I think there was a time in my life when that might have been close to possible, but as an educator now, if I was in a classroom, there's no way. Mm -hmm. But not only that, we don't have any of those matrix plug-in things, so we can't take what's in my brain and give it to my co-teacher or someone who's relieving me on, on my holidays, uh, or the assistant who's just started their Montessori training and wants to be able to, to um, practice um, the pink towel with children that actually need uh, mm. to be introduced to the pink towel. So the YCD app has a handy grid that uh, you can see your list of children and you can go into each what I call domain and see what who's covered what. I'd love to have had the whole thing on one page, but um, the iPad, you would have needed like binoculars uh, and glasses and a magnifying glass. So we had to break it into domains um, so that if you're coming in to relieve one of your educators classrooms, you can actually have a look. Oh, who needs to who's got some things for sensorial? You can also add readiness indicators. So you can walk in and go asterisk for this child, the pink tower. Let me see if they're interested in that today. Um, and it's just a matter of tapping and you can add the readiness indicators. When it comes to recording, you can um, pull the child up or pull the apparatus up and add it. And it's just a few taps. And if you want to let the parent know, depending on your service policy, you can just, you know, click tap, send to parent and it'll send a, we've got stock photos. So you can just send stock photos so the parents can see what apparatus you're talking about. Um, or you can add photos of the children. So that's the, the first thing. Understanding the Montessori curriculum, keeping it um, up to date with who's done what and who's ready for what and sharing that with your team. The second thing is planning in advance. Uh, you may have observed something in a child that you're wanting to plan in advance. And so there's a template um, which has resources, et cetera. So if you're wanting to do uh, a Chinese cooking dish with the children one day you need to bring in a wok and you need to get ingredients 
You can jot down your resources, plan it for a particular day. And then you've got the information all there. And again, you can add photos, send it to a parent, you can link it to Montessori. Um, the third thing is things that just happen. So you're out in the garden, the children find a ladybug um, and they're fascinated and you talk about insects and you, they're tiny, but she's got six legs and uh, we've got any other insects. That, and so you, you're taking photos or someone on your team is taking photos and you're just wanting to let the parents know this beautiful thing has happened. There's a template for that. But the other thing I, I didn't want to have happen is um, staff rewriting all their albums and then trying to think about how it links to the EYLF for every single thing. That process is important, that you do understand what you're doing and how it links to the EYLF. But if you think about a standard three-hour work cycle with 20 children, mm -hmm. and let's say the children do four things every hour, so that's 80 things. Um, per hour times the three hours, we're up to 240 wonderful things have happened in the classroom this morning. You're not going to be writing them all up at length and reflecting on it. And so we have built in links to, we have goals that we that are allocated and they link to both the EYLF and to the Montessori National Curriculum. There's a link embedded in that. Um, my staff were sometimes taking 40 minutes to replicate their albums. What a waste of time. Mm. Um, so that's why I wanted to build that in. There's still plenty of room for re reflective practices, templates for that. You can send home what's called a moment. Um, so that's the first reason is professional practice. The second reason, as I've alluded to there, is building meaningful partnerships with the families. And so um, being able to communicate with parents. Another part of it that I want to build is when they get their picture of their child or the stock photos of the child doing the red rods there'll be a button eventually um, it says learn more and they can click on that and it will be more information about the red rods but also uh, I'm hoping to embed information about the Montessori philosophy so things like um, the human tendencies or the fact that this is two-dimensional change as opposed to three-dimensional change in the pink towel all those sorts of interesting little um, fun facts um, with Pink Tower, it's about purposeful movement and the importance of providing children with movement in their early years. And so for each apparatus, I'm hoping I can find a fun fact. Um, so that's a little way off. Um, my brother says I have great ideas and then he has to do the work. Um, uh, that's a little bit true, but uh, um, they're still building more features um, mm. and will be on into the future in your child's day but um mm. had really wonderful people yeah um well, I, go ahead i'm just reading um there is no extension on some activities you don't have to always extend you follow the child sorry just answering one of the questions yeah um tracy i'm 56 so um yeah Still a puppy. Um, Vicky, you, you mentioned work-life balance is important for a staff. 20 years heading up a large service, um, developing a, and a training program with CARA and, and developing YCD. I think I know the answer to this, but how do you maintain work-life balance or do you? Oh, most definitely. Um, so... Kara has been uh, with us for um, well over 10 years. Um, our ops manager, Karen, has been, apart from a, a two-year stint uh, where she wanted to be non-contact and we didn't have a position at the time, Kara, um, Karen has been with me since the beginning of 1996. Uh, you, you just can't buy that kind of experience and loyalty and yeah. commitment to your vision and Derek. Uh, we have staff who weep because um, they want to move up in the company but they're also so dedicated to their service um, this this is how this is done and a little bit of sad story but uh, when my husband left suddenly um, nearly 11 years ago um, I took some long service leave 
and um, just worked two days a week while I dealt with all of that rubbish. And um, my brother Derek said to the senior team, Vicky's not going to be able to perform and uh, undertake what she has for some time. And so I came back to work and there was nothing to do. Um, and and also my workplace moved to home because we simply ran out of office space for college and other various activities that we do, um, five minutes from our Forest Lake service. And um, I think I'm not no longer leading services. I have um, great long-term people that do that. And that's what I talk about, cultivating your culture. And the other thing I like to talk about is horizontal Montessori, um, because one of the things I've found generally amongst adult Montessorians is they're very passionate about respectful um, relationships with children, where the respect is both ways, trusting the child, nurturing up the child, giving them opportunities to flourish. But then when they deal with the adults in their team, the philosophy doesn't always seem to translate so well. Uh, and so that's also something that I've spent time pondering over the years is how do we create a Montessori philosophy for leadership, mm. local leadership? Uh, and one of the things I have written, uh, it's very amateur, but is a, an emerging leaders course because we have our trainees come through, they get trained up and then they're apprentices and then they're leading a room. There's no leadership training in that. And how, how do we have someone ready to lead and guide other adults in their workplace? Um, so another plug that's available as a short course, if that's useful to you and your team on our um, college website. So it sounds like delegation is really the key. Oh, you know, absolutely. Finding, I'm finding no the super right people, training them and being able to rely on them. Absolutely. Yeah. It's trust again. It comes back to professional trust. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm finding that there's been times in my life where I've had to accept that people have done things differently to me and that's completely okay. Mm. And if you can't let go of control, you're never going to find a place where you can flourish yourself. Mm. Do you think it's the private profit, the entry to private profit in the early childhood sector that's been behind, led to the growth of Montessori in that sector over the last decade or so? That's my understanding. I think I think that um, in '91 the uh, federal government recognised this is me su supposing uh, that they couldn't meet uh, the financial infrastructure requirements for care for children whilst they got the mothers into the workplace, and that's a whole nother debate. Mm -hmm. And so they opened it up for private investment, and and for a lot of years. Um, there was a lot of scorn. Uh, well before my Montessori years, our local paper in where our first service was had a front page story that private childcare centres don't change nappies and that's how they make their money. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely horrific, slanderous kind of behaviours um, from the community sector against the private sector. Uh, we we do seem to have uh, moved past. Um, we do seem to have moved past that much of a divide. There's still a little bit of it out there. Uh, my view my view is that I, I probably personally um, not entirely comfortable with the large private equity firms that run childcare centres, although they may have great people doing great things in them and. Um, be ahead of the pack in some things I'm not sure um, but I know that for other family operated services I don't think uh, I don't think that you get that level of in investment on a personal um, level mm. um, that owners put into their services yeah. it's the same as anywhere if you've got an owner operator doing a business they're going to put more into it than just a staff member generally mm. I think Montessori we have um, an opportunity because people are buying into the uh, into the philosophy and they, they want to be part of something that uh, matches their philosophy so I think you can get greater engagement um, but yeah I do see um, Ecta has asked a question here um, referred to EYLF as a play-based service 
but isn't Montessori also play-based? Yes. I'm not sure what I actually said, but the EYLF is a framework, not a curriculum. Um, and so um, Montessori walks it in, like Montessori definitely meets the EYLF. Um, the new one I've started to look at, um, and it certainly um, is um, emphasising more inclusion and sustainability and other things, but I think um, Montessori uh, certainly still um, beats all of those if educators are aware of those things. Mm. We, we save the water and we water plants with it. Uh, we we build into communities. It's all consistent with our philosophy. Mm. Yeah, it seems to be a bit of a, a, a renaissance in of Montessori in in the United States at the moment, and it and it seems to be being led by for profit schools and chains like Higher Ground and and several others that um, kind of bring to bring together like Higher Ground, I believe has more than 100 schools um, under its belt and they use economies of scale and so on to to really refine their service and what do you think is the difference between in Australia between early childhood and the school age sector that stops people being able to think about for profit in the school age sector here as opposed to the United States well, um, Eddie Groves, who started the ABC chain, um, was going to go into private schools, privately owned for-profit schools. Uh, and Anna Bly, who was our Premier at the time, said, not on my watch and changed the Queensland legislation. I can't speak for the other states, but a number of privately owned for-profit schools at that point had to give their schools away or shut them down. Um, or hand them over to some type of parent committee. So I know that um, the Montessori school that was near Budrum um, fell into that situation. Um, the Sunshine Coast Grammar School near Nambour sold their school to Presbyterian Church Organisation. Um, so it, it, it's just a blanket no here in Queensland which means if I wanted to start a school, um, uh, I'd basically be, you know, required to do it as a philanthropic um, endeavour, which I don't, don't have the space to do that. I do not have the space to do that in my life. Mm. Yeah. I don't know about other states, other people may know. Seems odd though. Like, wouldn't, wouldn't if you were going to prevent, if you were going to suspect private profit um, as ruining education, wouldn't it be more? Wouldn't you be more likely to guard against early child early childhood centres going for profit rather than schools? Well, we actually live in a little bit of fear that um, there may be a sweep of a pen one day that outlaws it, and all of a sudden we'll get some type of compensation for something. Um, if the government decides to backtrack. The only thing is if they were going to give fair and reasonable value, it would probably break the country. So uh, there's also um, one of the most powerful lobby groups now in the early childhood sector is actually a, um, a group where you have to have a certain number of centres to be allowed entry. Uh, and so it's across private and um community so good start which is what abc became when the government handed it to a, a group of uh, philanthropic organizations uh, is in that as our um, ga guardian and a number of others um, that have been granted entrance to that because they actually control the vast majority of early childhood in australia uh, we're part of aca queensland which is part of aca national um, that um, are also involved in lobbying uh, for early childhood and did, did have some level of voice to government uh, when COVID hit. Um, they were able to change government policy around early childhood to ensure that 
services stayed afloat and doors stayed open mm. uh, because we're considered now an essential service. Mm. What do you see as the biggest challenges faced by Montessori in Australia? Clarity of our message, perhaps. Um, workforce is up there um, because you can't get an authentic program which is going to speak for itself if you haven't got the workforce to deliver it. You'll just be disappointing parents who um, who know what they want and you'll be misleading parents who think they're getting Montessori. Uh, and so I think that's that inconsistency. And um, having heard my story earlier, you'll probably understand why I don't think that we should disparage services that, that uh, put Montessori on their label and then um, fail to meet the standards that they probably set for themselves. We need to be actively supporting those services. Um, and I think that there's a language divide. Uh, I remember the first encounter I had, uh, there was an information night if you wanted to do the training with Mrs. Diker. And I turned up at Brisbane Montessori School and I sat there. And this little old lady talked about the cosmic and the psychic abilities of children. I've just gone, what is this? And then, of course, there's our favourite normalisation of the child. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that uh, somehow we need to clarify our, our broader message without getting stuck in terminology that's potentially inflammatory with the broader community, but without losing the depth of meaning. Uh, for those things mm -hmm. and that's a linguistic challenge so maybe some of our, our language needs to be updated a bit do you think there are other areas where Montessori needs to be updated to better fit the modern world Montessori did say to provide children with the tools of their time however I have a very great belief that children, especially the age of six, learn by doing. I nearly said require hands-on materials, but learn by doing with real items. And so um, any kind of, here's an app that does Montessori, you can build a pink tower mm. on the screen just makes me shiver because it's missing all the stereognostic, it's, it's you're missing the the weight of the different tower blocks. It's about visual perception, 3D on a 2D screen. It's not going to work. So mm. I, I also think that there will be research that comes in the future. I, I know my personal concentration um, has uh, decreased and I believe that's because of my use of my phone, which is a little addictive. Mm -hmm. um, at times, so it's easy for me to concentrate here because I'm talking about myself, but having to sit and listen to other people, I find that um, I, I drift off, my mind drifts constantly. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think that we're going to find that early introduction of technology is going to be detrimental for children. Um, having said that, um, Cara, who's on here, uh, I recall her in a classroom um, with a an, with an, uh, device out, um, looking up something on the internet about the different types of clouds as they were viewing clouds in the sky. And I thought that was a perfect use of technology with young children um, as that resource. Um, it's easy, it's to hand, it's just a matter of Googling. Um, whereas it might take you three weeks to order a book about clouds. And at that point, the moment is past. Yeah. Ekta asks, how do you manage parents' expectations and management's expectations at the same time by keeping the ethos of Montessori? Yeah, so parent expectations, is it's about parent education. So one of my uh, leaders, uh, I'm not sure it was about nine months ago. No, it would have been more than a year ago now. Gosh, that's how you get old people. Mm -hmm. um, she decided to do two weeks with no documentation and she set that up with the parents. And um, they were expecting no documentation for two weeks. And it was a bit of an experiment. Uh, I did write an article about it, which went out from Montessori Australia at the time, uh, about the liberation that the staff experienced. And they really didn't have parent complaints. 
Um, I must admit, I'm probably a, a pretty slack parent, but I used to turn up at the end of the day, see my child was still alive um, and seem reasonably happy and just a little bit grubby. And um, I'd take him home. That was when I had one. Um, I had three. So multiply that story by three. Uh, and um, and I was as happy. And I guess I could see it in my child, what I needed to see. Uh, I even felt guilty because I kept forgetting to read the what we did today that the staff had laboured over with, you know, floral borders, etc. Um, because I could just see my child was happy and doing well. It's so, yeah, you have to kind of put the boundaries in place. Uh, one of the stakeholder meetings we had for your child's day, um, they don't send home anything till end of term. So mm -hmm. parents have radio silence for. 10 to 13 weeks and then at the end of term they'll send home some records about what the child has been doing uh, so I think as a service you need to come together and um, do a reflective practice so Hector I imagine that you're not in management because your next question is about management but one of the things we have in the EYLF is the requirement to reflect now how often you reflect and what you reflect on is entirely up to you and perhaps a suitable topic to spend some time reflecting on um, is uh, how much documentation and how do we meet parent expectations without it becoming a burden on educators that takes them away from the most important thing, which is engaging and facilitating with the children. Speaking of reflection, what, what do you think is the, the secret of the transformation of the teacher? Oh, I think it's multifaceted. So you have to have the knowledge and then you have to transform that into practice. And that's actually a gulf. Mm. You've met those people that can talk the talk but don't walk the walk. Mm -hmm. They've not breached the gulf. They've not, changed, they've not allowed that knowledge to permeate from their head to their heart. Mm. It's the ability to look at oneself mm. and to step outside oneself and look at oneself. And it's a, a, a humbleness uh, and, a, and an ability to self-critique and to keep learning yourself. Um, that, that's maturity. And some people don't get it. Mm. Um, some people never get it. And I don't know if it's that, um, is it Maslow's where you get to, uh, what's the top one of that is, I um, can't think of it today. Someone help me out. What's the top of, it's. Um, self-realisation. Self-realisation. Yeah, self-realisation. Yeah. 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 Do you think it's also about being able to look at your own pain? Oh, Definitely. I had a conversation with someone today who's having a really difficult time, new mum, discussing return to work and personal circumstances. And I said to her, this is a time that is difficult for you, but it is just a season. Mm. And the way you grapple with this particular time in your life uh, will provide you with tools for how to tackle further things in your life when they come up. Yeah. We don't want to get stuck in a victim cycle. And sometimes I do it, everyone does it. It's like, oh, I'm so tired. Um, I've got so much, you know, and I think I think that we need to pull ourselves out of that. Yeah. It's up to us to count our blessings and to be grateful and to be happy that we've woken up breathing. I think as you get older, sorry, old person here, um, that that uh, impending sense of mortality probably yeah. brings it to your face. We're not 10 yeah. foot tall and bulletproof anymore, but um, gratitude for what we have um, was listening to the radio that pretty well everyone in Australia is in the top 10% of wealth in the world. Yeah. Do we live like that? Yeah. You mentioned before clarity of message. How do you think as a movement we can sharpen our, our, our message to the general public? Well, I loved your little 
what's he man you're gonna to have to say the word i can never remember how it's pronounced oh homunculus yeah in the yeah. why montessori video the why montessori video that was excellent how do we get it in every home mm. um we need to make our parents our advocates and we need to make it a movement we've got a certain number of people who dedicate saturday morning um once a month to try and build this organization and to progress it um we have a, a narrow group of volunteers who uh, are working very hard and uh, I, I thought it was a little bit funny um that uh, i'm on this tonight as some sort of notable montessorian um because i'm just in my corner doing my thing and I'm sure that there's many of you who are on here tonight who are in your corner doing your thing. Um, but somehow we can work together um, to make a clear message to the broader community. Uh, and I think it needs to be workshopped because words matter. And uh, as I said earlier, cosmic, psychic, uh, normalization, uh, these are all important things uh that that we need to communicate mm. i was actually playing with normalization the other day and i was coming up with um capable engaged um in the learning and social environment and it it's sort of when i put it together was like silly does that look like silly with a c mm. um so we need to hi elliot uh we need to uh perhaps clarify that and maybe that's a project um that we work on in Montessori Australia and hopefully there'll be a bunch of people who are interested in participating and supporting that mm -hmm. um a plug for the early childhood group um we are uh we've been very bogged down trying to deal with floor beds um after my services we got compliance notice for using floor beds in our infants room mm -hmm. um but there's a, a great many other things that we're hoping to tackle uh, and to get our voice to government and to the community. Mm. Um, On a hopeful note, we should probably end there. Vicky, thank you so much. This has been such a such an interesting hour listening to you. Really appreciate your time. Does Thanks, anyone everyone. have have any last comments or a question? We've got about two minutes left. I'd like to thank Mark for organising these sessions because it's a really good little touchstone in everyone's busy lives and we're all running our schools and doing the best we possibly can. So to listen to another professional talk about their lives is, um, I find it really inspiring and, and it's a, such a passion that we all share that uh, and we're all isolated in our little silos in our schools. So I find this forum is um, it's so national, and I just feel that it joins us a lot more because it's regular too. It's not like you just oh wow I'm seeing Vicky at a conference and you just on each other and you're chatting and then that's it for another year. So what you're doing, Mark, is fantastic at facilitating this. So thank you. Yeah. First and third Mondays of every month, as you probably know. Well, thank you, everybody. See you in two weeks.